for the role of Islam in Bible prophecy the past couple of days and um, we're going to change gears here at this point but if we accomplish what we want to accomplish we it, it is going to come dovetail into that truth um, because what we've been identifying about Islam is that they are marking the latter rain has arrived and this will reach this conclusion as well only from a different argument from a different approach so on 67 page 67 of your note it's there's a rather long quote from signs of the times July 4th 1906 that says as we near the close of this world's history the prophecies relating to the last days demand our study especially demand our study the last book of the New Testament is full of truth that we need to understand Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study let every let the book of Revelation in, in connection with the book of Daniel demands close study. Let every God-fearing teacher consider how most clearly to comprehend and present the gospel that our Savior came in person to make known to his servant John. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. None should become discouraged in their study of revelation because of its apparently mystical symbols. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraideth not. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. We are to proclaim to the world the great and solemn truths contained in the book of Revelation. Into the very designs and principles of the church of God these truths are to enter. There should be a closer and more diligent study of this book, a more earnest presentation of the truths it contains, truths which concern all who are living in these last days. All who are preparing to meet their Lord should make this book the subject of earnest study and prayer. It is just what its name signifies, a revelation of the most important events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history. When you're presenting this message, you'll find that one of the arguments that is often off raised up to oppose um, the emphasis that is made about the events of prophecy is that yes we're supposed to study the book of Revelation and teach it but we're supposed to teach the gospel in Revelation and Sister White just mentioned that here at the beginning of this paragraph let every God-fearing teacher consider how most clearly to comprehend and present the gospel that our Savior came in person to make known to his servant John but as Sister White follows that sentence and begins to describe the importance of studying Revelation and um, presenting Revelation that last sentence um, that we read summarizes at, least, is at least summarizes at least part of the gospel of Revelation when it says it is just what the name signifies a revelation of the most important events that are to take place in the last days of this earth's history John, because of his faithful trust in the word of God and the testimony of Christ, was banished to the Isle of Patmos, but with his banishment did not separate him from his banishment did not separate him from Christ. The Lord visited his faithful servant in his banishment and gave him the instruction regarding what was to come upon the world. That's what the book of Revelation is. It's instruction about what is to come upon the world. This instruction is of the greatest importance to us for we are living in the last days of this earth's history. Soon we shall enter upon the fulfillment of the events which Christ showed John were to take place. As the messengers of the Lord present these solemn truths they must realize that they are handling subjects of eternal interest and they should seek for the baptism of the Holy Spirit that they may speak not their own words but the words given them by God. The book of Revelation must be opened to the people. Many have been taught that it is a sealed book, but it is sealed to those only who reject truth and light. The truths that it contains must be proclaimed that the people may have opportunity to prepare for what? For the events which are soon to take place. The gospel is the good news. 
the good news is that the book of Revelation identifies the events that are about to take place in order that we might prepare for those events in advance of their arrival. That's the gospel. Part of the gospel. The truth that it contains must be proclaimed that the people may have an opportunity to prepare for the events which are soon to take place. The third angel's message must be presented as the only hope for the salvation of a perishing world. The perils of the last days are upon us, and in our work we are to warn the people of the danger they are in. Let not the solemn scenes the prophecy has revealed are soon to take place be left untouched. We are God's messengers and we have no time to lose. Those who would be co-workers with our Lord Jesus Christ will show a deep interest in the truths found in this book. With pen and voice they will strive to make plain the wonderful things that Christ came from heaven to reveal. <coughs> the next quote, um, uh, I'll leave for you to read on your own time. I'm just going to pull a couple things out of it from Acts of the Apostles, 585. And this is generally common understanding for us in Adventism anyway. The names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of Christian era. And we're going to be considering the seven churches. And we typically understand as Adventists that um, from Ephesus to Laodicea is a symbolic representation of the history of the Christian church from the time of the disciples until our day. Um, and it, in the second paragraph, it says that Christ is spoken of as walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. This is symbolized by his, this thus is symbolized his relation to the churches. So we need to understand the Christ connection to these churches. He is the one that is governing the providential history of all these churches. And we're going to look at these churches. It's sometimes you you sometimes I but I'm assume we're all this way when we're trying to illustrate something like this we finally get to a point where we, we realize yes this is how I like to illustrate it on a blackboard it works for me and then you're stuck on that for a long time this presentation I haven't arrived at that point I still haven't figured out what's comfortable for me to try to illustrate it and therefore there's probably a better way to illustrate this but we'll start here this is Le Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Okay, this is the seven churches. We'll start building on that. <coughs> um, so go to page 69. You'll see where we're going in a moment. Um, there is a a very nice quote that I've referenced here once before and haven't dug out for you. I actually had a, a thought run through my mind this morning that I'd go ahead and pull it up on the a CD-ROM and bring it here in here on my laptop and read it to you, but I didn't. But there's a place where Sister White actually quotes some of the beginning rules of William Miller and then places her endorsement on it. So she's very specific about her endorsement. But this one on the top of page 69 is um, good as well. This may even be that very quote that I have selected the, one of her summarizing statements out of. I don't remember. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted. Uh, which means if you look at William Miller's rules that we circulated yesterday for you to take a look at if you never have, um, some of his rules are either have been discarded just from you know, just omission by not knowing them, but some of them are actually argued against. But by and large, some of us may be using his rules or may not be using his rules, but we're very, very few of us are actually familiar with his rules. But Sister White says those people that are proclaiming the third angel's message will be operated upon those very same principles of Bible prophecy. So it would be good, you would, you would think, if that's the case, to become familiar with those rules. Um, and so from the reason I have this in here though is because I want to quote from William Miller and use some of his logic about the seven church, put it into our seven churches, put it into our study here. This next quote is from William Miller. It says, The seven churches of Asia is the history of the church of Christ in her seven forms and all her windings and turnings and all her prosperity and adversity from the days of the apostles down to the end of the world. Then he says, The seven seals are a history of the transactions of the powers and kings of the earth over the church in God's protection of his people during the same time. Then he says, 
the seven trumpets are a history of seven peculiar and heavy judgments sent upon the earth or Rome or Roman kingdom and the seven vials are the seven last plagues set upon papal Rome mixed with these are many other events woven in like tributary streams and filling up the grand river of prophecy until the whole ends uh, ends us in the ocean of eternity this to me is the plan of John's prophecy in the book of Revelation and the man who wishes to understand this book must have a thorough knowledge of the other parts of the word of God the figures and metaphors used in this prophecy are not all explained in the same but must be found in other prophets and explained in other passages of scripture line upon line here little there little therefore it is evident that God has designed the study of the whole even to obtain a clear knowledge of any part now there's parts here what William Miller just said that I disagree with and and Dwayne and I just had a very brief conversation about this and this is a, a little bit of the illustration of my answer to <coughs> Dwayne's question but the part I, that I want to see want you to see that I do agree with is, is M Miller is saying that these seven churches although <laughs> they're just lines here um, first church, second church third church, fourth church fifth church sixth church and seventh church these histories are repeated and enlarged upon by the seven seals. First seal, second seal, third seal, fourth seal, on down. And, I and that the trumpets repeat and enlarge upon them also. Now, the difference that where I would disagree with Miller on this, and it's not important to spend time there, is he's, he's seeing the seventh trumpet as the punishment on papal Rome, but he's seeing the seventh trumpet as pu punishment on papal Rome there and then in his history. So he's calling it Papal Rome then and, and he's not understanding about modern Rome that comes to the throne of the earth at the end of the world and therefore his application of the seventh trumpet is placed in that history instead of the history of the end of the world. And it's, it's in those areas of pioneer understanding where I, I, I usually arrive at a little bit different conclusion. But anyway Uriah Smith, I want to I want to reinforce a couple of, of thoughts here. And Uriah Smith says in the Biblical Institute, page 253, the seals are introduced to our notice in the fourth, fifth, and sixth chapters of Revelation. The scenes presented under these seals are brought to view in Revelation 6 and the first verse of Revelation 8. They evidently cover events with which the church is connected from the opening of this dispensation to the coming of Christ. He's saying the seals represent events that cover history that begins with Ephesus all the way to the end of the world. Okay, He's saying the same thing as Miller just said. Seals are, are running, repeating in larges. But I, the reason I have Uriah Smith's quote in here is I like this, this last paragraph. I like the way he says it. While the seven churches present the internal history of the church, the seven seals bring to view the great events of its external history. So he's, he's not only emphasizing repeat and enlarge, he's giving us a little, a little contrast so we see the purpose of this repeat and enlarge. The churches are the internal history of the Christian church in this time period. The seals are representing the external forces that are dealing with the churches in that history. Okay? But... So this is, this is the first seal, second seal, third seal, fourth seal, fifth seal, sixth, seventh. All right? But I want to make a distinction now. <coughs> when it comes to repeating and large, in, in actuality, it's just the first four seals that actually repeat the history of these. But the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal, there is a distinction made in the scriptures. Structurally, the last three seals are identified as different, and we're going to show you that the last three seals, they don't, the, the fifth seal does, is not a parallel history to the fifth church. It, it, it's easy to see. I, I may be confusing you a little bit here, but the seven churches, the seven seals, and the seven trumpets are operating upon the principle of repeat and enlarge. But in the structure, the way that the book of Revelation has been designed, there is a purposeful distinction between the first four seals and the last 
three seals. The four, first four seals are, are represented by four horses. But the last three seals, you don't see those horses. So too with the trumpets. There's a purposeful distinction between the first four trumpets and the last three trumpets. The first four trumpets are trumpets. The last three trumpets are woe trumpets. Okay, so the, the structure of Revelation is, is identifying a distinction between the last three and the first four. And what we're going to show you here is that the first seal is covering the same history as the first church. The second seal is covering the same history as the second church. But when we actually get to the fifth seal, then there's a break in the progressive history. Notice what James White says. We have now traced the churches, the seals, and the beasts, or living agents, as far as they will compare to covering the same periods of time. So and the reason that... James White says the seals and the beast are the living agents is in the seals you see these beasts, these living agents. He, those are just things that are found in the seals. He's talking about the churches and the seals. We have now traced the churches and the seals as far as they will compare as covering the same period of time. He's, he's saying they are repeating and enlarging upon one another. The seals are seven in number. The beasts are four. First four seals are four beasts. The last three are not four beasts. And it may be well to here to notice that in the opening of the first, second, third, and fourth seals, the first, second, third, and fourth beasts are heard to say, come and see. But when the fifth, sixth, seventh seals are opened, there is no such voice heard. Neither do the last three churches and the last three seals compare as covering the same period of time as the first four churches and the first four seals do. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying that the first four seals are repeating and enlarging upon the history of the first four churches, but the last three seals, they're not repeating and enlarging upon the history of these churches. He's, he's making the same distinction that, it, that I set you up for before we read this quote. But as we have shown, the churches, seals, and beasts do agree as covering the same period of time for the space of nearly 1,800 years till we come down to a little more than a half century of the present time. He's saying that the, he understands that the fourth church and the fourth seal ends when? 1798, at the end of papal rule. Okay, so he's saying this history goes for 1,800 years. Churches and seals run together for 1,800 years but then there's a break. All right. Yeah, yeah, he's speaking of the 1840 time period that he's living in. So, <coughs> page 70. We're, that's just one thought. We're going to build some thoughts. Um, yes. Seals, churches, okay? Um, now, it, uh, those people that present the refreshing message of Isaiah 28, 9 through 13, one of the things that those teachers, one of their characteristics is, is that they're no longer drinking what? Milk. Okay, so... Uh, I should be able to expect, although it's not always the case in this particular presentation, but I should be able to expect, as a teacher, of people at the end of the world that are no longer drinking milk, that we all know that the first church is Ephesus, the second church is Smyrna, the third church is Pergamos, the fourth is Thyatira, the fifth is Sardis, the sixth is Philadelphia, and the seventh is? Uh, okay. So we're all, I don't have to put those, those names up there, right? So... What's the third church? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pergamus, Thyatira. Let's look at Pergamus and Thyatira, but let's remind ourselves what Pergamus and Thyatira were. In a very general, very general historical overview, Ephesus is the Christian church triumphant. This is the disciples that carry the gospel to the world, all right? Amen? You understand that? But after that came a time period of persecution. Smyrna, right? After Smyrna comes a time period of compromise. 
who's who's the historical figure that would would identify this particular time period of compromise Constantine okay this first Sunday law 321 this is where the the pagan belief system is getting brought into the Christian church through the efforts of Constantine this is Pergamos right Thyatira is the 1,206 years of papal rule. So we want to look at Pergamos and Thyatira to, to make a point. Everyone understands then that Pergamos and Thyatira is the history of compromise by Constantine and Thyatira is the history of the papal rule. So if you go to 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 5 through 8 which is in your notes. You don't have to use your Bible. You can use your Bible. In 2 Thessalonians 2 5 through 8 it says remember you not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now you know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When William Miller was trying to understand what the daily was in the book of Daniel, it's these verses here that allowed him to understand what the daily was because these verses are speaking about the appearance of the man of sin, the mystery of iniquity, the papacy. These verses are speaking about when Thyatira, the fourth church, is going to come into history. But it's saying that before Thyatira, the mystery of iniquity, the papacy, comes into history, that there was a power that was restraining him. It says, in the center there, it says, for the mystery of iniquity hath already work, only he who now letteth, and a better translation of that word letteth would be restraineth. And the, the Hebrew theologians, or the Greek theologians will tell you um, that that's a fair representation of let it, letteth. Only he who is now restraining the papacy will continue to restrain the papacy until the one that is restraining the papacy is taken out of the way. And the one that is restraining the papacy is Pergamos, pagan Rome, Constantine. Constantine the pagan Rome is the, the power that precedes the papacy. So oh, there's a lot that you of course can say about these verses, but follow me here. Here's what I want you to see. These verses here are speaking about pagan Rome restraining the papacy and the arrival of the papacy. Do you see that? You may not have understood that before, but that is a correct understanding of these verses. So these verses are speaking about paganism and papalism, but more important to our study, these verses are identifying the history of Pergamos and Thyatira. Do you see it? Do you see it? Okay. And that's... That's just this, that how, do, how are we to teach truth? Line upon line. So Pergamos and Thyatira is a line of history, but Second Thessalonians 2 is just another line of the same history, teaching a different, different aspect. Are you with me? Okay, go to, re in your next biblical reference there in your notes, Revelation 13, 2, it says, And the beast, and this is the papal beast, the papacy, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, and that's pagan Rome, the ra dragon gives the papacy three ta things. His power, his seat, and his great authority. We looked at this a little bit yesterday. Pagan Rome gave its military power to the papacy with Clo beginning with Clovis in 496. It gave its seat to the papacy in the year 330. And it gave its civil authority to the papacy in the year 533 when Constantine, or no, when Constantine, when Justinian made his decree identifying the pope as the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. Therefore, in Revelation 13.2, you see the work of pagan Rome placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. Okay? Therefore, Revelation 13.2 is describing the historical relationship between Pergamos and Thyatira. Do you see it? It's another line of the same history. Okay? Now, you know, so far, so far, I'm giving you all fair warning. So far, all we're teaching is what's been taught in Adventism if someone was touching these subjects all the way through Adventism. 
but in a short period of time, Lord willing, we're going to take these truths and share st stuff that has never been taught in Adventism. So you want to catch these little building blocks along the way because you're probably going to hear something you've never heard before here in a moment. And then you're going to start thinking, what did he say? So follow along here, okay? Daniel 8, 11, and 12. We're, we're going to t accept these verses as the pioneers understood these verses, not as these verses are taught in modern Adventism. And it says, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And we're saying that this is pagan Rome that magnifies himself to Christ at his birth and in his death. And by pagan Rome, the daily paganism, the religion of paganism, was lifted up and exalted because the word that's translated take away there is the Hebrew word room and it means to lift up and exalt. And the place of pagan Rome's sanctuary, which is the city of Rome, was cast down in the year 330 when Constantine decided to move to Constantinople. He cast down the city of Rome and a host, an army, was given the papacy from Paganism. This word against, it can also, believe it or not, be correctly translated as from. And it was the pagan powers that provided the military strength to the papacy. And they did so by reason of transgression through the combination of church and state. And the papacy cast the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered for 1260 years. I can defend all those thoughts given time, but that is not my purpose here. All I want you to see is that Daniel 8, 11 and 12 is once again describing the historical relationship between pagan Rome and papal Rome and the work of pagan Rome placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. Therefore, Daniel 8, 11 and 12 is also the history of Pergamos and Thyatira. It it, if, I, if you want me to clarify that for you, I guarantee it's going to take a lot of time. I can go through it again, no sweat. But Okay, I'll go through it again. These are two verses. Verse 11, the subject is pagan Rome. Verse 12, it switches to papal Rome. So th that's one of the things you would have to note there. Verse 11 is pagan Rome. It's he. In verses 9 through 12 in Daniel 8, if it's he, if the little horn is he, it's pagan Rome. If it's it, it's papal Rome. Okay, yea, he, pagan Rome, magnified himself even to Christ. Christ is the prince of the host. It did so at his birth when it tried to kill him, and it participated in his death, thus magnified him, him, the himself against Christ. And by him, by pagan ho Rome, the daily... Paganism, the religion of paganism. Through pagan Rome, the religion of paganism was lifted up and exalted. In fact, why do we call pagan Rome pagan Rome if it didn't exalt the religion of paganism? You know, we don't call it Methodist Rome or Mormon Rome. We call it pagan Rome. <laughs> okay, it lifted up and exalted paganism. I, I know more. <laughs> I don't want to go there. All right. And it says... And the place of pagan Rome's sanctuary was cast down. And the, the, the temple of paganism that was the premier temple of paganism when it ruled the world was the Pantheon Temple that was located and still is located in the city of Rome. It means Pantheon Temple means the temple of the gods. And so when it says that the place of his sanctuary. It means the city. That's where his sanctuary was located. That city was Rome. And it was cast down by Constantine in the year 330 when he determined that he wanted to move the capital of the empire to Constantinople. And a host, this is the next verse, host being an army, military strength, military power, was given the papacy a, from although it says against, from the daily, from the pagan powers. It's the seven European kings, pagan powers, that gave their military strength to the papacy to place it upon the throne of the earth. And the re 
the way that that was accomplished is through the combination of church and state and that is the transgression. They gave their military strength to the papacy by reason of transgression by bringing church and state together. That was the transgression and it, the papacy, cast the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered for 1260 years. And, and there's a lot to say about that but what I want you to see is once again this is the history of Pergamus and Thyatira. Do you see it? It's just all we're doing. If, and let, if I'm correct on how I'm telling these verses, if I'm not teaching you the wrong history for these verses, if my understanding of these verses are, are correct, all I want you to see is that these are just other lines of prophecy that are the history of Pergamus and Thyatira. Okay, that's, that's what I need you to see to, so we can move ahead in this um, study. The next one is Daniel 12.11. It says, And from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the Hebrew word that's translated take away here is not room. Room means lift up and exalt. That was what we just read in Daniel 8.11. This Hebrew word is sir, and it means removed. So it says, from the time that the religion of paganism is removed, and when the backbone of pagan resistance was removed in history, um, which was holding back the papacy from coming to the throne of the earth, was at the, the Battle of the Visigoths in the year 508. When the Visigoths were defeated in 508, all resistance from pagan powers to the rise of the papacy had been removed. They'd been taken away. And then the abomination that maketh desolate, the papacy, was set up. It was being set up. And from that time, 508, there should be 1,290 days. And of course you can see um, these time prophecies reflected um, uh, on this chart here. Starting at 12, the, just extending the 1290 from the year 508 brings you to 1798. And of course connected with that would be the next verse, which is brings you to 1843. But what I want you to see in 1211 is once again we're seeing the work of pagan Rome and its resistance being taken away in order to place the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538. We're seeing the history of what? Pergamus and Thyatira. Yeah, the beginning. They don't always encompass the entire history, correct. I don't mean to infer that they do. Okay, now in an, the next biblical quote is Daniel 11, 30, 31. By the way, some people would disagree on some of the historical applications I'm making to these verses, all right? There's disagreement on some of them. I'm forewarning you, and you need to test it for yourself. But what I will tell you is I, of course, believe it's correct, but I will also tell you this. If you take the book, Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation, by Uriah Smith, which Sister White says is God's helping hand, he will be giving you the same historical application that I'm giving you. Okay. So in verse 30 of Daniel 11, it says, For the ships of Chittim, and by the way, um, the ships of Chittim, this is the second trumpet of Revelation 8. Okay. This is Genseric, yes. Um, for the ships of Chittim shall come against pagan Rome. Therefore he shall be grieved. Pagan Rome's getting uh, decimated by the trumpet powers and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. In that history, pagan Rome launched an attack against um, the Bible. Uriah Smith will tell you. So shall he do. He shall even return. He returns to Constantinople, and then it says, and he, ha he shall have intelligence. He'll have a dialogue, a communication with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And the power that forsakes the Holy Covenant in Bible prophecy is this compromised church, the Christian church that compromises. The Christian church falls away from the truth. Okay, so pagan Rome in this passage is opening up a communication with the papal church, the church of compromise, the church that fell away from true Christianity. So pagan Rome in verse 30, it, verse 30 concludes with pagan Rome opening up this dialogue with the papal church and then in verse 31 it says, and arms shall stand on his part. Military strength will stand up for the papacy beginning in the year 496 with Clovis. 
and they, the military strength, the, the military strength is the point of reference for 31. Arms shall stand up on, on his part. The military strength will stand up for the papacy. First they stand up, and then they pollute the sanctuary of strength, and the, the sanctuary of strength for pagan Rome was the city of Rome, and in the warfare that ensued after the year 330, as the trumpets began to blow, when those barbarian powers and Genseric out of northern Africa, when they launched their wars against Rome, the, the prize they were after was the city of Rome. So in that history, the city of Rome was the point of conquest over and over again. So when it says military strength will stand up for the papacy and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, they're going to, it's identifying that the military powers are going to pollute the city of Rome over and over again in this ebb and flow of warfare with the city of Rome being the point of conquest throughout it. And these arms, military strength, shall take away the resistance of paganism. And this word also is sir, meaning remove. And that was accomplished by Clovis at the Battle of Visigoths in 508. And they shall also, the military strength of pagan Rome, they shall also place the papacy on the throne of the earth in 538. So once again, these two verses are the history of Pergamus and Thyatira. Okay? Everyone see that? Now, here's where it gets interesting. Notice this quote by Sister White. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with a spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Now, let me, let me ask you a question. Everyone remember that Daniel 11 verse 40 begins with these words, and at the time of the end. That's Daniel 11 verse 40. It begins with the words, and at the time of the end. How many remember that we've, we've put a quote in your notes that we've read here, that Sister White identifies the time of the end as what? So, when Sister White here is speaking about the future fulfillment of Daniel 11, she knows that the first 39 verses are already past history, right? Because she knows verse 40 begins in 1798. All right. So she says, we have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the stir spirit of war. We soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel, verses 40 to 45, has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that's taken place in the fulfillment of this prophecy. What prophecy? Daniel 11. Much of the history that has been fulfilled in Daniel 11 will be repeated in the last six verses of Daniel 11. Okay? But after she see, she's given us a principle, she's saying if you want to understand the last six verses of Daniel 11, then one thing you need to understand is that the history represented in Daniel 11, the entire chapter, provides you with historical parallels that will illustrate the last six verses of Daniel 11. But then she points to the most important history in Daniel 11 that prefigures the last six verses of Daniel 11. She says this, in the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved, she says. And then she quotes verses 30 to 36. So she's just referenced the fulfillment of Daniel 11. And then she says there's histories in, in Daniel 11 that will be repeated when Daniel 11 is fulfilled. And then she quotes verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11. And as soon as she finishes quoting verses 30 to 36 of Daniel 11, she said scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. Do you see my point? My point is this is the history that she points to includes verses 30 and 31. She quotes verses 30 to 36. And verse 32 to 36 is just uh, more information about the papacy. She quotes verse 30 to 36, and verses 30 to 36 is the history of Pergamus and Thyatira. But you know what she says? Seen similar to those described in the history of Pergamus and Thyatira are going to be repeated 
In other words, Pergamos and Thyatira are repeated at the end of the world. Do you see it? <laughs> the history of Pergamos and Thyatira, which is the, the third and the fourth church, are fulfilled in the history of the seventh church. Do you see it? <laughs> okay. Now, but, but the history of the third and fourth church, that is also the history of the third and fourth seal, is it not? So, we should expect to see that the third and the fourth seal are repeated in the end of the world, and the end of the world is Thyatira. So if you go to your next page, you'll see Revelation 6, 6 through 8, which is the the third and fourth seal. We won't read it because of time, but th that is the third and fourth seal. Please test it. Read it on your own time. And underneath it, you have a quote concerning the opening of the seals from Spirit of Prophecy. And I'm going to drop right to the last paragraph of that quote from Manuscript, Volume 9, page 7, where Sister White says, The same Spirit is seen today that is represented in Revelation 6, 6 through 8. And if you want to know what Revelation 6, 6 through 8 is, it's the quote at the top of the page. It's the third and fourth seal. She's saying the same spirit is seen today that is represented in the third and fourth seal. History is to be repeated. That which has been will be again. The third and fourth seal is going to be repeated in the history of Laodicea. Do you see that? Okay. On page 71... It says the third and fourth seal, and I have that biblical quote, and then underneath that there's a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, and I didn't read the whole quote. I dropped to the very last bold-faced part of it. The same Spirit is seen today that is represented in the third and fourth seal. So you, do you see what I'm saying? Even if you don't know where I'm going with this, because we're going somewhere with this, is that there are several lines in, in the Bible that repeat the history of Pergamos and Thyatira and one of them is Daniel 11 verse 30 and 31 and Sister White clearly teaches that Daniel 11 verse 30 to 31 is repeated at the end of the world but the end of the world is the seventh church it's Laodicea so if if that history is repeated at the end of the world it means that Pergamos and Thyatira are repeated at the end of the world but we already established that the history of Pergamos and Thyatira has been repeated and enlarged upon in the third and fourth seal therefore we concluded without even reading the last quote that if the Pergamos and Thyatira are repeated in Laodicea then probably the third and fourth seal are repeated as well and then we read a quote where Sister White plainly says the third and fourth seal is repeated at the end of the world okay now, some of these churches, some of these, the histories of these churches have, they're connected. You can't really separate them. Okay, per, you can't separate Pergamos from Thyatira because it's the compromise represented in Pergamos that allows the papacy, Thyatira, to come into existence. If there was no compromise of Pergamos, there would have been no Thyatira. Okay, the, it's cause and effect. And Sister White often says that God's people need to learn to reason from cause to effect. Now another church, two churches that you can't separate are Ephesus and Smyrna. Can you separate them? No. They are cause and effect. Why are they cause and effect? Because this is the, the church triumphant in that history. They are carrying the gospel to the world. They're the white whores. But the Bible teaches that all those that live godly in Christ Jesus, what? will suffer persecution. Here's the persecution. Here's the living righteously in Ephesus, cause and effect, Smyrna. You can't separate them. In fact, if all you had was Smyrna, if you knew the church was being persecuted, if that's all the information you have, then you know that immediately before that persecution that the church was living righteously because all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You have that in your notes, 2 Timothy 3.12. And of course, those of you that, are, that remember, um, and I don't know that we spent a great deal of time on it this weekend, but if you remember the reform lines, well, the reform movement of Christ, John the Baptist, 
is a perfect parallel to the reform movement of the Millerites. In fact, Sister White often compares William Miller with John the Baptist. Does she not? Yes. She, she compares the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem with the midnight cry of 1844. She compares the disappointment of the disciples after the cross with the disappointment of the Millerites on October 23rd. Parallel histories, and she does it often. We've read it we, one place we've we've mentioned over and over here again this weekend is Great Controversy 611, where she com says the Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God, and then she says it will be similar to the history of Pentecost. She's so what she's doing is she's comparing Ephesus with what Philadelphia, Philadelphia, right? But what have we, what, ha what was one of the main principles we taught here this week, or this weekend, over and over again? That the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter in Laodicea, right? Right? We showed that, didn't we? Okay, Millerite history repeated. Therefore, if the Millerite history is Philadelphia, and it is, but Philadelphia is a parallel to Ephesus, then Ephesus is a type of Philadelphia, but because Philadelphia is a type of Laodicea, then Ephesus will also be repeated in Laodicea. I'm losing you. So will Smyrna, because you can't bring Ephesus forward without bringing cause and effect with it. Uh, but, but do we think there's going to be martyrs in the time period of Laodicea? Oh, there's Smyrna. Easy to see, is it not? Why are there going to be martyrs in the time period of Laodicea? Because the Lord's going to raise up the valley of dry bones. They're going to become a mighty army and they're going to perfectly reflect the character of Christ. That's Ephesus. That's the white horse, the first seal. Right? So we can bring... I didn't make enough room. We can bring the first and the second church down here also. Right? So let's... let's factor in some quotes here. You have in your a reference to early writings, page 259, where Sister White compares the history of Christ with the history of the Millerites. In Christ Object Lessons 170, she says, Judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil make himself a prey. Thus was fulfilled in the life of Christ on earth. He was loyal to God's commandments setting aside the human traditions and requirements which had been exalted in their place. Because of this, he was hated and persecuted. This history is repeated. The history of Ephesus, time period of Christ, is repeated when the 144,000 perfectly reflect the character of Christ. Right? Okay, so the easy principles to show. A, a long quote, because of time, I'm not going to go there. Um, Next page, Southern Watchman, where she is taking once again the history of Christ and John the Baptist, and she plainly says this history will be repeated. Uh, underneath that, from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 111, um, she says that Satan is work doing his part to repeat the history of the Jewish nation. So, Ephesus, and you can't separate Ephesus from Smyrna. Ephesus is repeated here at the end of the world. That's what those quotes say. But we already know that Ephesus is, uh, was already repeated in Philadelphia too. And we've, this week we've shown that Philadelphia is repeated in Laodicea. Okay. Now, the reality of it is, even it, with the, the seven trumpets, this is the seven trumpets, you can see that the last three trumpets are different than the first four, just as you can see the last three seals are different than the first four seals. Beast, 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 no beast, no beast, no beast. It isn't so easy to see that there's a break in the seven churches, but there is. And upon the testimony of two, one, two, a thing is established. And the pioneers understood, taught, that Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea were all contemporary churches in their history. 
Okay. The, the Millerites believed, and they had ver some variations of belief, but still they, all, they dealt with these three churches. The faithful Millerites, they believed, were the Philadelphians. The unfaithful Millerites were Laodiceans. But the Millerite message was being carried to the Sard Sardinians. <laughs> to Sardis, whatever, however you would say that. To the Sar Sardisians. Um, and so you, on t top of page, uh, well, let's start with page 72 from Manuscript Releases, volume 18, 193. Oh, what a description. How many there are in this fearful condition. I earnestly entreat every minister to study diligently the third chapter of Revelation. Now, what's the third chapter of Revelation? It's Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I earnestly entreat every minister to study the the history of Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, for in it is portrayed the condition of things existing in these last days. She's saying Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea are illustrating the history of Laodicea. And uh, I don't know how to do this one. Five, seven, six. They're all there. All churches are going to be repeated here at the end. And in the next quote you'll see Joseph Bates um, speaking of his understanding of all three churches, Sardis, Laodicea, and Philadelphia being existing in his time period. Therefore the break that you see in the churches, if you're, so I can finish that thought for you, is it, even though the pioneers understood that these churches were illustrating the history from the beginning of the Christian dispensation to the end of the world, they understood a distinction in these last three churches in that they were, they operated contemporaneously with one another and we're saying they do again we're saying that there will be those in the Adventist church that receive the seal of God that's Philadelphians Let, let's, let's not say it that way there will be those in the Adventist church that are wise virgins Philadelphia and those in the Adventist church that are foolish virgins Laodicea and there's two places where Sister White says the foolish virgins are Laodiceans okay that but there is a message that the Adventist church is to proclaim that goes to Sardis, those outside of Adventism. Okay, so in both cases, in Sardis, you'll see a nice quote here on page 73 from Taylor Bunch, where he's defining the word Sardis as those escaping or that which remains. Okay, that's, that's the meaning of Sardis. And he's identifying this as the remnant, and I'm saying that it fits. These that escape from Babylon, the word Sardis is a fit definition for those that escape from Babylon when they're called out after the wise and foolish virgins of Adventism are separated from one another at the Sunday Law. So, <coughs> if you th what I'm saying here, brothers and sisters, is this. I'm saying that yes, the seven churches represent the history of the Christian church all the way to the end of the world, but that isn't all that it represents. There's other lines of truth in there, and one of the things that you can demonstrate is that each, every one of these histories is repeated in our history, the history of Laodicea. And therefore, automatically, if you maintain the pioneer understanding, if you're going to say that Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira are repeated at the end of the world, then you're simultaneously saying that the first, second, third, and fourth seal are also repeated at the end of the world. Are you with me? Okay, so now, it, just so you understand that at this point, this is not necessarily my only, I'm the only one that has this opinion. Stephen Haskell wrote a book on Revelation and there's some quotes here from the story of the seer of Patmos. The first reference from page 69 says, it should be remembered that as the experience of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos will be repeated in the last church. What's the last church? Before the second coming, so the history of Thyatira will have its counterpart in the last generation. He's teaching the same thing that you were just taught, even if you've never heard it before. Next quote from page 75. He applied the test, Miller, but all pointed forward to the year 1843 as the time when the world must welcome its savior. 
the condition of the people at the first advent of Christ the condition of Ephesus was now repeated in Philadelphia page 75 76 there was a time in the history of Pergamos when Christianity thought paganism was dead but in reality the religion which was apparently vanquished had conquered paganism baptized stepped into the church in the days of Sardis this history was repeated Haskell's telling us that that the condition of Sardis is paralleling the history of Pergamos therefore the they come down to the end of the world with one another and then from page 69 he says upon this last church what's the last church upon Laodicea the remnant shine all the accumulated accumulated rays of all past ages now he just took a step beyond where we've been all past ages goes well before Ephesus Testimonies, Volume 8, page 301. The solemn messages that have been given in their order in the Revelation are to occupy the, occupy the first place in the minds of God's people. Wow. The solemn messages in the book of Revelation are to occupy the first place. <laughs> there was a brother, and, and, and we have a long-term relationship, and we're on good we're on good terms as far as I know. I, you know, I don't s interact with him that often, but one time he had us invited uh, at his own initiative to come and speak to his church on prophecy. And for whatever reason, before he pulled the trigger on that, he uh, emailed me and he says something like this. And, and it, it's an Ellen White quote um, that I, I don't know word for word, but it's probably familiar to most of you, seeing as you're, um, some of you are working in medicine here at Loma Linda. He says, I decided not to have a prophecy presentation because uh, Sister White says it's the health message that fits us up for heaven and that's all we really need. Okay, <laughs> which is, it's okay. I, you'd have to understand a long-term relationship with this brother. Um, and uh, it, it's good. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just making this point. The solemn messages that have been given in the order, in their order in Revelation are to occupy the first place in the minds of God's people. Nothing else is to be allowed to engross our attention. Precious time is rapidly passing and there is a danger that many will be robbed of the time which should be given to the proclamation of the messages that God has sent to the a fallen world. Satan is pleased to see the diversion of minds that should be engaged in the study of the truths which have to do with eternal realities. The testimony of Christ, a testimony of the most solemn character, is to be born to the world. All through the book of Revelation, there are the most precious elevating promises, and there are also warnings of the most fearfully solemn import. Will not those who profess to have a knowledge of the truth read the testimony given to John by Christ? Here is no guesswork, no scientific deception. Here are the truths that concern our present and future welfare. What is the chaff to the wheat? Shall we pray? <coughs> Father in heaven, we ask that uh, you'd forgive us if we haven't made uh, the prophetic study, um, put it in the priority that you would have us in our day-to-day um, -day experience. Help us to understand that we're all called to be students of prophecy and that there is things at the prophetic level that you wish us to understand if we are to be prepared to reflect your character in the coming crisis. Forgive us for um, the, ap the Laodicean apathy that we might have had in the past and grant us an outpouring of your spirit that uh, that apathy might be removed and that we might have your spirit's presence to understand these things um, that you wish for us to proclaim to the world. We thank you for the time we've spent here this weekend upon the mountain top and ask for your continued presence until we part in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so the next meeting is only 20 minutes away, so if you have like a quick question. All right. Hold on, hold on. I always wonder what this question means. What is the chaff to the wheat? What chaff is, uh, wheat is nutritious, chaff is not. Chaff is just the, you know, the dry, 
worthless part of the, the wheat plant. So the question is, is why do we worry about eating the unnecessary part as opposed to just eating the wheat? Why spend, it? She's, she's emphasizing what's supposed to be pr highest priority. The wheat is the study, the solemn message that had been given in the order and the revelation. That's the wheat. Why be studying um, what it means that there are contrails in the heavens or black helicopters? Okay, what is the chaff to the wheat? Any other? Okay, so I think let's go out and stretch, get some blood circulating.